Hi everybody, I'm Ingrid Vandervelt, the founder and CEO of Empowering a Billion Women by 2020, and we are here with Michelle Lee, the Undersecretary of Commerce and Intellectual Property and the Director of the United States Patent Office. Welcome. It's a pleasure to be here with you today, Ingrid. Thank you, thank you. Well, it is so great to see you. We're back at South by Southwest, and last year was a big year for you. Last year was a very special time for me here at South by Southwest. One year ago, tomorrow, I, uh, I was sworn in as the Undersecretary of Commerce for Intellectual Property and Director of the United States Patent and Trademark Office, and it was a special honor to do it here at South by Southwest with all these innovators, disruptors, and entrepreneurs as head of America's Innovation Agency. Really a special moment for me. Well, Michelle, I mean, I can only imagine how incredible that was. You are the first woman to ever be appointed by the president to run the patent office. I mean, this, I know you know that not only is this just such a great honor for you, but what you represent, the opportunities you represent for women around the globe. What was that like for you when you got that call? And they <laughs> said, you're it, we want you. Well, it was a real honor and privilege. I mean, if you think about it, Ingrid, the Patent and Trademark Office and patent law goes back to the beginning of our country. It's literally in our constitution. So to be the first woman to hold the leadership role at the United States Patent and Trademark Office in our country's 225 year history is a special honor and privilege. And I'm delighted to be the first one. And I, you know, better late than never, but it's always good. Well, I want to dig into that a little bit, but I'd love to actually take a few steps back and talk about your own personal journey. Because I think a lot of people that might see you or meet you, they think, I don't know that I could ever do that. I mean, she's done such extraordinary work. And so you and I were talking actually before we even started filming about your childhood and what brought you into technology in the first place. You told a great story about being with your father. Okay, so I was born and raised in the Silicon Valley and my father was an electrical engineer. And the neighborhood that I grew up in, Ingrid, all the dads, and it was dads back then, all the dads on my street were engineers. And I just grew up in an environment of invention and innovation. I remember in our garage, he had a workbench with soldering iron, circuit board, resistors, and he just was tinkering. And I just thought that everybody had that stuff in their, back, in their garage. And I remember looking back that one of my first science projects, if you will, was building a Heathkit handheld radio with my dad on this workbench and so forth. And I didn't realize, Ingrid, that not all girls did this or had this background as part of the growing up. And I would definitely say that being around tinkering and creating and inventing and designing, that was very much a part of what I grew up with. The Silicon Valley was apricot orchards, but people had great ideas. They would start a company. Sometimes it succeeded, sometimes it didn't, but a few of them revolutionized the world and the way in which we live. So I've always wanted to be a part of that innovation community. I love math, science, and engineering. I ultimately studied engineering at MIT. Then went on to Stanford. I went on to Stanford, yes. And I, in the meantime, I also worked at uh, the MIT Artificial Intelligence Lab and HP Research Labs, and you know, science and invention and STEM is so important for our country, and I took it for granted growing up. And I think all of our kids, right, need to develop a talent or an interest or uh, an interest in those areas. What role did your mother play? <laughs> Interestingly, she's a scientist as well, so you could say it is literally in my in DNA. Your blood. Yeah, <laughs> there was no getting away from it. But she's a um, bacteriologist. But, um, so I do come from a, a family of scientists and that could very well explain why I'm here and doing what I'm doing and doing what I've done, which has always been a part of the innovation ecosystem from the technical side, from the business side, advising some of the most innovative companies um, in our country, including um, in a wide range of industries, including Google most recently when I started when it was a relatively young company and then it grew into a multinational company. Well, you were with Google back in the early days. You started, I think, 2003. Correct. So you were there before people even knew the, the Google. And what, did you even, when you started at Google, I'm just really curious, at that time, did you have any <laughs> idea of where that was gonna go? So I'll tell you, that's a very interesting question. I was asked to join Google at the time of the dot-com bust. 
So I was representing, I was a partner in a law firm representing all kinds of high tech companies and it was the dot com bust. And this little company called Google came and said, Michelle, I'd like you to come and help us with our intellectual property issues. You clearly help lots of companies with these issues. Would you come do it for us? And I don't know if you remember this at the time, but at that time, there was Ask G's, <laughs> Alta Vista, Excited Home. It was actually around this time Yahoo, I got my first patent. Microsoft. Did you? Yes, yeah. okay. right around that time. But I remember Google popped out and I was like, what is this thing? We were doing artificial intelligence technologies, developing uh, personalization software using neural nets. I love that you were doing this, Ingrid. <laughs> Thank you. But Thank I was you. watching you stuff. guys. Yes. Yeah. But I was watching you guys and saying, what is this company? And I remember our top scientists like, this is going to change the world. But yes, it was Ask Jeeves. So all these search engine companies and the business model was still being sorted out to some degree. And I thought, why would I join this company in the dot-com bust? But you know what? I liked the search engine. I thought it delivered results that were better than the other ones. And I met the team, and it was a really great group of individuals. And I thought, well, I can give it a try. And if it doesn't work out, I'll always go back to my law firm partnership, and they'd be delighted to take me, and I'll have an incredible experience. And one year became three years, became five years, became seven years, became eight years. And during that time, it literally evolved from a company that had US presence only to almost every country across the globe. The products and services that they offered back then were very limited, online advertisement, a few other things. And by the time I left, um, driverless cars, Google Glass, Google Maps, e-commerce, and I mean, you all know. I mean, well, and Megan Smith, right. who also now our chief technology officer, she was running Google X. That's right. It? Yeah, and That's right. overseeing all of those programs. So did you and Megan actually come through this all together? You're sort of friends from way back? So we go way back. I mean, it turns out that I met Megan like two days into college at MIT. <laughs> oh my gosh. So I, we that, met there yeah. and then we met again at Google. She was there just slightly before me, just by a little bit. And then I go to Washington and then Megan comes to Washington. <laughs> so our careers have gone <laughs> like this. And you know what? It's all fantastic. I actually do believe that yeah. more uh, people with from the technology and the business sector should go into the private, the government sector, and bring that expertise to help our agents, our government. Right? President Obama spoke about it uh, when he was here at South by. We and could not agree more. We actually hosted a panel yesterday about the importance of policy and the changing political landscape because of all the women as, as well that are getting involved. We are very active in policy initiatives because we feel like if we're going to encourage women and girls worldwide to get involved in STEM initiatives, right. you have to do it in collaborations with the political agencies. Right. And you and Megan are perfect right. examples of what's possible yeah. there. And I will say that, I mean, in my role now as the head of the United States Patent and Trademark Office, um, at the highest level, the goal of the agency is to promote American innovation uh, through intellectual property rights. And in my mind, that means across every geographic region in this great country of ours and across every demographic. So that includes girls, that includes people of all backgrounds, all ethnicities, all socioeconomic groups, because our companies cannot hire the technical talent they need, the top technical talent they need to meet their business needs. And in my mind, we cannot afford to leave and not nurture and develop any of that that we have in the United States. I mean, people are asking Congress to modify the immigration laws to allow more technical talent to come in the country. We can nurture a lot more what we've got here. Well, and you serve as such a, a great example of what's possible when you team the private sector with the political arena. For example, in bringing the patent office out to the people. Mm -hmm. So this is the first time that's happened. You've set up now four offices, Detroit, Dallas, Den Denver, Silicon Valley. Correct. How has that begun to, what is the impact that you've started to see happen in, in doing that? That's a right. big it's, step. It's a big change. And I mean, any business, you're a businesswoman, Ingrid, you know that anytime you have a customer base in a certain area, it makes perfect sense to be out where your customers are. Um, in Washington, you know, for a long time, all of the businesses are most, we were located, we were located in the metropolitan D.C. area, and as you know, I come from outside Washington. I come from 3,000 miles away from You're Washington. You're outside the Beltway, as they say in D.C. <laughs> I am very I grew outside. Up there. I could have come from Hawaii, <laughs> but no, I came from California, and I very much understand that there's a lot of innovation. Most of the innovation occurs outside the D.C. area, and if the USPTO 
which offers so many resources for entrepreneurs, for um, our youngsters, even just getting them excited in invention, creation, and making. If we can bring those resources out across the country, our country will be better off for it. So uh, in 2011, Congress passed the American Invents Act. We were able to set up for the first time in our country's 225 year history, offices outside the DC area. And these offices are amazing. I mean, they, all the startup com uh, companies, they don't have the resources to be right there in Washington to take full advantage of all that the PTO has to offer. So if you're right there in the innovation community, giving training on the basics of invention, um, intellectual property, patents, trademarks, copyrights, and really also importantly, getting our kids, mm -hmm. being, making them aware that to invent something is not so difficult. Anybody can do it in ordinary circumstances if they see an idea about how something should be done differently or better, and our kids are wired that way, we should be nurturing it and promoting it, and if they have an entrepreneurial streak, we should encourage that. So really, it's about being in the community and promoting a system that would encourage invention and entrepreneurship for our future country's economic success. So Michelle, I know you know you are making it possible. You're encouraging people of all backgrounds, um, from everywhere, to be inspired to get involved in the patent process. But if we look at women specifically, and we look at back in the '70s, I think two or three percent of all patents were from women. But that, that number has increased a lot. In depending on what you're looking at, between ten and eighteen percent, I believe, eighteen percent in academia. So actually, fewer than fifteen percent of US-based inventors listed on patents are women. But why do you think it is that more women haven't applied for patents and aren't doing it just yet? Yeah, well, it does require at least an interest or a passion, if not a background in science, technology, engineering, math, computer science. And you know this and I know this, but statistically, girls do very well in math, science, in math and science at the younger grades. But as you move up, and I know this as a woman in STEM, as you move up into algebra, calculus, chemistry, physics, differential equations, they just start dropping out. And so I think it's something like you know, a small percentage of women enter STEM fields, and um, many of them don't stay in, the, in those fields as they move on. And so to file for a patent, you have to be innovative, you have to be at the cutting edge, you oftentimes have to be a leader, in a particular area. And I think sometimes women too self-select. They think, oh, what I have is not that big of a deal. But you know what? Never self doubt yourself. You'd be surprised, right? I mean, if you've got something there, you should try filing for it. And the US Patent and Trademark Office can determine if that's new, useful, and not obvious. So don't doubt yourself. Just jump right in and go ahead and file. Well, Michelle, with your with your background, I mean, again, you've had this extraordinary career, and and I'm sure you're just even scratching the surface, which is almost unbelievable to say. But I'm curious if there was ever a moment in your background or in your career where you had what a lot of women have, which is a self doubt of, you know, I, I can't do this or this isn't for me. Did you ever have a moment like that, or were you always saying, it's in my blood? <laughs> It is what it is. So I think at all times, we all have our self-doubts, but you know, I have to say I give a lot of credit to my parents, and um, I know you're very close to your parents. I had the privilege of meeting your lovely parents. and <laughs> They were so happy to meet you. I they loved that day. It was such an honor to meet them, <laughs> and, and they clearly must be so proud of you. But really, I mean, you do what you need to do, and you don't let somebody tell you that you can't do it. And if you and I waited for people who looked like us, to do what we do, we'd still be waiting. I mean, there was nobody who looked like me doing what I did, right? And if we wait, you're gonna be waiting for a while. So decide what it is, where you can make a contribution, what you can do, and just go for it. And you know what? So many incredible people support us along the way. Be very grateful for that. Give back to the generation before uh, below you. And I think our society will be better off for it. That is fantastic advice. So actually, let's build on that for a moment though and now talk about, so for everyone who's watching this, mm -hmm. men and women alike, but even especially for those women that we really want to encourage to get involved in this patent process. Or men with daughters. Men with daughters. I always, yeah. I mean, look at how your father impacted your life, certainly my father in the same way. I agree with you wholeheartedly. What are some practical steps that you would suggest to women who they're watching this and they say, you know what? I'm going to take a look at this because this could really make sense for me and my business. 
So the question is, what would be the practical steps to say, okay, where, what should they do? Would you say, yeah. well, talk to the attorneys that I you see. use in your business okay. first, or would you say, come to the USPTO mm -hmm. website, mm -hmm. because I want to ask you about all of the resources yeah. that I know you have there that yeah. we'll just cover here in a moment. Yeah. What would you say? So I would say, if you're a woman in STEM or a business, or anybody, really, men or women, or be aware, make of intellectual property, and the, what, how that tool can be used to support your business. And so we have Women's uh, Entrepreneur Weekends at the Patent and Trademark Office and all of our regional offices in Denver, Dallas, Detroit, and Silicon Valley. Come join us. And you just familiarize yourself with these tools. And you can decide as a business matter which ones you need to help build and grow your business. It will vary depending upon your industry, depending upon your competitive landscape. But we offer everything from what are the basics? What is a patent? What is a trademark? What is a trade secret? Um, we have an IP online assessment tool, intellectual property online assessment tool, where you answer online a few questions about your business, your product, and they can then help identify at a high level what intellectual property assets you might have and therefore what are the next steps to protecting it. And eventually you may need to hire a lawyer, but make yourself smarter about these tools because intellectual property is a critical tool for the growth of our most innovative companies. If you think about it, um, in this day and age, I mean, back in the Industrial Revolution, our most valuable assets were tangible assets. Right. Inventory, factory, machinery. But in this day and age, in an information-based economy, it's the intangible assets. That's right. It's a company's brand. It's a company's process, algorithm, design, that are the most valuable assets. You look at our most valuable companies and it's the intangible assets protected by intellectual property. And you having sat inside Google and watching the explosion of what happened with this very young company mm -hmm. and the valuation of that, mm -hmm. the impact that mm -hmm. making sure you're protecting that intellectual property can have on a company is it's tremendous. tremendous. Yeah. And every company has a brand that they want to protect. That's protected by a trademark. And many of these companies have a special technology that's gonna distinguish them from everybody else that's protected by patents and other forms of intellectual property. So really familiarize, familiarize yourself with this aspect of your business that can help support its growth. And well, we can help, the PTL can help with that. Michelle, we are so grateful for you and all that you do. I mean, you're truly demystifying the process of going through and protecting your intellectual property. It's something that I think everyone is starting to begin to see, I can do this too. Mm -hmm. You don't have to have millions and millions and millions of dollars in the bank you all are making it possible for people to tap into resources that, again, at any background, anyone right. can, can move this process forward. And now we're in four cities across the country, so come visit us, or you can even dial in through webinar. So we're really trying to make the intellectual property system available to everyone. Well, Michelle, thank you for all the incredible work you're doing and for being back here with all of us and here at South by Southwest. And we can't wait to continue supporting you on your journey. And just thank you for being such an incredible role model for all of us. Thank you, Ingrid. It's a pleasure yeah. to be with you here today. Thank it's you. so great to be